Well, Seaman wasn't going to put up with that and had a stinking row with Mays. I think he demanded his money back. It was always rumoured there was a bit of a hell of a row went on between them. Dick took his car away from the ERA team. From now on, things were going to be run his way. He set up his own workshop and employed his own team of top mechanics. He was very focused on what his engineers and his mechanics were doing. And he developed a technical feel for the machinery, which was very unusual at that time for any racing driver, and particularly for a gentleman racing driver. Now Dick got results. He won the Coppa Acerbo Junior at Pescara, the Prix de Bern, and the Maserick Grand Prix. It wasn't top Grand Prix level, but Dick was now known as a winner in respected events across the European racing calendar. Dick Seaman seemed to go into a class way above the ordinary amateur racer. Uh, they went on the continent and they were always here, there and everywhere. We couldn't keep in touch with them. Soon everyone knew where he was. Returning to England, Dick's success was unstoppable throughout 1936. Some of Britain's most famous drivers took part in the road racing for the British Empire Trophy at Castle Donington, near Derby. Freddie Dixon, Earl House went screaming round the course, taking... The old names were soon swept aside as Dick demonstrated his superior skills. He won his next two events at Donington, and then there was the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man for a day is given over to the roar of high-powered cars. Watch number nine. Young Richard Seaman was the winner in spite of a smashed windscreen and a head cut by flying stone. Well done. Dick's success continued abroad and caught the attention of the most influential man in motor racing, Alfred Neubauer, the team manager of Mercedes-Benz. Alfred Neubauer was so impressed with Dick Seaman's ability that towards the end of 1936 he sent him a telegram uh, asking him to go to Germany to test drive a Mercedes racing car. Mrs. Peter Seaman opened it and saw that it was for Dick from Mercedes and she knew of Dick's ambition, obviously, to join the Mercedes, and she was also aware of the worsening political situation in Germany. So initially, she hid the telegram in a book, and then had second thoughts about it, and uh, showed it to Dick. She must have been torn over this, because she didn't like him racing, but clearly he was very good at it. So I think part of her wanted him to succeed, and part of her wanted him to stop. But he was unstoppable. His mother had already spent £30,000 on his passion. Every time he had asked for more, she had always given in. She had lost her son to motor racing. Now she would be losing him to Germany. Dick couldn't wait. After years of suffering the frustrations of British engineering, the Mercedes offer was a dream come true. Now he had to be approved by Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer himself. In February 1937, Dick's contract arrived. The Fuhrer had given his approval. For Dick, there was no turning back. Dick was the only British driver to reach this level of motor racing, now monopolized by the two German teams, Auto Union and Mercedes. Dick would have to prove himself as the British junior at the wheel of a German car. He was earning a massive £3,000 a year, plus a share of the team winnings, but he was forbidden to take his money out of the country. So he had to make Nazi Germany his home, renting a chalet just 30 minutes' drive from Munich. I think when Dick Seaman first joined Mercedes in Germany, um, he fitted in like a, 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 a round peg in a round hole. Um, he liked them, and they liked him. He was regarded as something of a curiosity by the established drivers, because they all knew that Brits can't drive, you know, self-evident. But he very rapidly proved to them that he was a quick boy. Dick was getting used to his new car, a Mercedes W125. 
built to win, it was Hitler's display of Germany's might. The cars could not weigh more than 750 kilograms, and the Mercedes engineering team went to any lengths to lighten the bodywork, drilling holes into every piece of metal to reduce weight. The car boasted a sophisticated chassis, independent front suspension, and hydraulic brakes. The Mercedes would have been an outright world beater, yet Hitler knew the benefits of competition. His encouragement of Dr. Porsche's auto union had produced a second, equally formidable machine. The biggest deviation from the norm with auto union was to make the car mid-engined, i.e. putting it behind the driver instead of in front, but also in front of the rear wheels. As has been proven with um, all Formula One cars, it's the correct place to put the engine. Auto union and Porsche were just a few years earlier. Faced with such revolutionary competition, Mercedes' ingenuity was pushed to the limit. Mercedes went to the nth degree to save weight in the process, i.e. lots of the castings were made of magnesium. Most of the fastenings on the car are wasted. This gets rid of a little bit of weight, and then the top there, and a little divot gets rid of a bit more weight. And if you do that to every component on the vehicle, you're obviously going to make a significant difference. But despite all these measures, the Mercedes cars were still too heavy. When the cars were weighed, they weighed in just a smidgen over 750 kilograms. So what they did was scrape off all the paint and all the filler, and they ended up with silver cars, and that was the start of silver being the German national racing colour. After years of British engineering, Dick found his new Mercedes offered a level of perfection he'd only dreamed of, and the power beneath his foot was exhilarating. I liken it to a rather overpowered go-kart. You know, it, it is totally drivable on your right foot. You put your foot down, and you sort of created a bit of smoke because the wheels spun, and if you weren't very careful, they'd spin on each gear change as well, irrespective of speed. But it's a tremendous car, and um, one which I have a tremendous amount of admiration for the people who drove these on the sort of circuits they drove them. At Dick's first race in Tripoli, San caused his engine to stutter a few laps from the end, and he was seventh. Dick's teammate, Herman Lang, won, and Mercedes celebrated. This was superstardom. Dick was surrounded by the most famous drivers in motor racing. Legendary names like Rudolf Caracciola and Manfred von Brauhitsch were now his teammates. But the atmosphere between the drivers was super competitive. And his next race at the Avis Grand Prix in Berlin looked more daunting. The bank track had been specially built for speed records and the Silver Arrows were fitted with special streamlined bodywork to gain extra performance from the long straights. The cars looked so intimidating that the Italians dropped out, leaving only Mercedes and Auto Union to compete between themselves. On the six-mile straights, the streamliners could reach a top speed to match a Formula One car today. Dr. Goebbels made the most of this blatant display of power. Dick battled his way up the order. He finished fifth, but he was the second fastest in the Mercedes team. After years of struggle, Dick was making a name for himself in the world's greatest race team. He soon got news that the Germans planned to race in Britain at Donington Park. Here was his chance to prove himself on home turf. Germany was also looking forward to a resounding victory. The arrival of the Silver Arrows in England was devastating. I always remember the crowd thinking there were miles and miles and miles of queues. But in them days, we'd never seen such a crowd. And it was, of course, the famous cars. Dick knew the circuit better than anyone and was anxious to excel in front of his home crowd. Dick was favoured fourth at the bookies, 
He enjoyed seeing Raymond Mays further down the odds. The German cars left the opposition standing. And the proficiency of the pit stops were eye-opening. It was fantastic to see them and, you know, all the same overalls where good old England wanted to have a jacket on, wanted to have a shirt on and everything, you know, ran down. And they were all dressed up smart, all the same, and you thought, ooh, aren't they efficient? Dick wanted to show the British amateurs what real racing was. The silver arrows lapped the British cars as they struggled around the circuit. It was a different world. The cars were so advanced and the performance and everything. It was very exciting to watch them. I know which was something I hadn't seen done before, when they were putting thermometers on the tires to see what temperature the rubber was. Incredible, we'd never thought of doing that. And even the tire makers never said check temperatures. It was a frightening speed to think of. And then when they got to the old airpin bend, you know, they used to just leap off. So you could see it under the wheels. It looked fantastic. Dick was unlucky. Nudged off the track by a rival auto union, he was later forced to retire. But the race gave English onlookers an awesome spectacle. This time, auto union won. But behind the celebrations, Hitler's Grand Prix in England made the German threat very real. After the race, Dick went away to the Swiss Alps. He was enjoying the glamour of his new life. But the fears his doting mother felt for him were now underlined by the mood of the country. The British were rattled and sent the politician Lord Halifax to Berlin for talks. The power of Nazi Germany strengthened each day, and in February 1938, Dick was summoned to attend the annual motor show in Berlin. Along with his fellow teammates, he was presented to Adolf Hitler. There were speeches from Dr. Joseph Goebbels and by the Fuhrer himself. Dick realized he was now ensnared by the Reich's propaganda machine. In a letter, Dick wrote, he spoke of the many daring young racing drivers who risk their lives to win prizes, not for love of their machines, but for the honor of Germany. Being a puppet of Nazi propaganda had its rewards. Dick was at last free from the purse strings of his mother and now his life was about to take a new turn. On June the 15th, Dick received a call from an old racing friend, Aldi Aldington, inviting him to a party. There, Dick became captivated by a young 18-year-old called Erica Pop. It seems to be in love at first sight, and they sort of danced the evening away. And she spoke fluent English, and uh, it all blossomed from there. Erika was the beautiful heiress of one of Germany's respected families. Her father was the managing director of BMW. Seven years younger than Dick, Erika's good looks had put her picture in the socialite magazines. Erika was bowled over by the dashing English racing driver, and their romance over the next few months brought them closer together. In the team, the competitive edge between the drivers sharpened as Dick became faster. As he became more and more proficient and more reliable, the team number one and number two drivers, Rudy Kratzler and Manfred von Brauchitsch, became more distant from him. The quicker he got, the more of a threat he posed to their position. <laughs> 